Hey, good morning, Grove. We're gonna begin our worship service a little different this morning. Uh, by now, many of you have experienced things that have taken place in the Twin Cities these past few days that have been really difficult. It started with many of us seeing a video of the senseless murder of George Floyd, and then the ensuing kind of chaos that's taken place in the greater Twin Cities and all over the world. And as Christians, when things like this come up, often I think our tendency is to wanna to either bypass them and skip them because they they raise feelings and emotions inside us we don't know what to do with but i think it's important as a church for us to stop and to recognize the things we're seeing are unjust the things we're seeing are sinful that we're seeing uh, people live out the human condition which is people broken apart from god and the reality is is that no matter where you look there are situations here that we're experiencing that aren't right and that we need to see justice and so as Christians, one of the things I think we need to do is to together focus on what we've been doing these past many weeks, which is looking at God's word and specifically looking at Psalms of lament. We've looked at the idea that do we believe our times are in God's hands or do we believe that God's not in control of what's going on in the world anymore? And so I want to encourage us by starting our worship service this morning. You're gonna be hearing a word later today from a guest speaker who's gonna talk about this idea of healing and seeing the future. But I think for us, we need to start by actually praying that God would be just. God would be just in all situations and that we would be people who speak love and grace and hope and peace, the peace that God has. So when we lament, we actually cry out to God. Uh, it's complaints, frustrations, bitterness, hopelessness, the things that we often think God can't handle, but he can. And so I'd like to lead us together and a prayer of lament um, for what's going on in the greater Twin Cities and even in our hearts. So would you please join me as we pray? God, we just come before you not knowing how we're supposed to respond to tough situations. And God, as we saw this video of the murder of, of this man, Lord, it, it broke our hearts. Lord, there's an injustice there and we have to trust that you're a just God, that there will be justice in this lifetime, but also in the next. And God, as people seek to deal with these emotions and feelings and some of what's underneath, we all come at this from different perspectives, but God, our heart is to recognize that you've created us in your image. And your heart's desire is that we would walk in obedience and walk in dependence on you. And so God, as people mourn and grieve and deal with hurt and hate and the frustrations that rage up because of history and past and injustice, God, let us be people that lean towards you. There's so many passages in your word that speak to the idea of us being able to mourn and to mourn well. And so God, I pray as people try to understand and to seek peace and to seek healing, may you let our faith leaders, may you let our faith community, may you let people of, people of peace, people of the word, people of a great God be people who bring hope and healing to our communities, Lord. We know this isn't your desire for your people. And so we pray that you'd move in a powerful way. God, as we worship today, let us evaluate where our hearts are at in this journey. Let us be people who point towards the hope that only you can bring. In your great name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're with us. Thank you for allowing us into your homes to worship with you. 
for us to worship God, we need to be able to see him. And in these times that just get weirder and weirder, sometimes our vision is clouded. So we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes anew, to reveal to us God our Father, so that we can rest in him, so that we can worship him. Let's invite the Holy Spirit this morning.
Hey, good morning, Grove Church. My name's Scott Foster, and I'm just excited to welcome you to worship God together this morning. If you're a guest here, join us for the first time. We'd love to be able to connect to you and to be able to send you a gift. If you just click that Get Connected link on our website, it would allow us to follow up with you this week. Someone from our team will reach out to you. There's some things coming up in the life of our church, but this morning is actually very special. We have a guest teacher here with us. It's the superintendent from the North Central District of the EFCA, our denomination, Brian Ferrone. And he's gonna share from God's Word this morning a message that's really designed to help bring healing and encouragement both to our church, but also in the season of life we find ourselves. But one of the things we're also excited about this Sunday is tonight at 7 p.m. we're actually gonna have a concert of prayer as a church. It'll be our first live stream event, so live at 7 p.m. You can check it out through our website or through the Facebook page at The Grove or through our YouTube channel. There are different ways you can connect, but it'll be a live concert of prayer with different people leading us through elements of prayer designed to really to promote um, coming together, seeking the Lord, both for our country, for what's going on in our nation, what's going on in our city, and what's going on in our church. And so it's a time for us to really seek God on behalf of our own lives, but also our church, and for how we can actually encourage Him to be a part of the journey that we're in. So please join us at 7 p.m. It's gonna be a powerful time, and we're excited to invite you into that journey. Also next Sunday, we have an opportunity to partner with our student ministries in an event called Moving On Up. It's actually a, a middle school and senior high grad night. Although grad nights have been canceled all across the nation, we're actually gonna have a drive-in grad night here at the Grove. And at 7.30, anyone from our church can come, park in one of the parking lot spots on our main parking lot as you enter campus. And then at eight o'clock, we're actually gonna have a drive-through graduation with our students. And so it's a little bit like a drive-in movie. We have the technology set up for us to be able to participate together, to support our students, and to start off summer the right way. So we'd invite you to join us, come celebrate the students who've been a part of this church many for many years, and, and help them celebrate the next chapter of life that they have together. And then lastly, it's what's coming ahead in the future. Many of you received emails from me or others in our church talking about the idea of regathering the church, the idea of reopening the facilities again for people to come and meet. And so this week, two very important things are gonna happen. Number one is we're gonna send out an all church survey to our church body. We have some questions we'd like to ask you about things related to regathering as there's restrictions in our state and in the nation about coming together. We wanna to make sure we make decisions that are best practices for our church body that are both seasoned by God, but also with wisdom for our people. And so we'd invite you to fill out that survey and two, on, July, on June 14th, we're gonna actually start live streaming our services. So the same way we do the concert of prayer, we're gonna have worship services. And that's a pivotal step for us because we need that to be able to connect the people who have to stay at home because of health or other reasons. Maybe they're afraid to come back and gather at the church. And we wanna be able to keep our church connected together. So we encourage you to sign up for Facebook accounts or be prepared to join us live as we flip that switch and ultimately as we prepare to regather the church. And so please fill out that survey and begin for us to be ready to live stream our services. We're so excited you're here today. We're excited to continue to worship God now. Thanks for being here with us. Let's sing it out. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great He has done great things. Oh, here of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive. You break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake in the light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, 
Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lonely seas to where they rise? Against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you need the more or less inclined. I'll search and stop and know you're just like.
mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave. Thank you, Jesus. I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the song of where my feet are. I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night makes me stray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Good morning. Uh, brothers and sisters of the Grove Church, my name is Brian Farone, and I serve as District Superintendent for EFCA's North Central District. I'm grateful to be here with you today. I wish we could be together, uh, but I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, to be with you, to share God's word with you, to talk about the situation that you're experiencing, and to talk just a little bit about the difficulty we're all facing here in the Twin Cities. Before I begin my sermon, and even before I address uh, the challenges your church is facing, I want to take just a minute to say a word about what we're seeing in the Twin Cities right now. Uh, my heart is heavy today. Um, I'm heartbroken at the senseless, uh, brutal murder of George Floyd. I'm heartbroken at our cities as they groan um, and uh, experience so much civil unrest and, and are really tearing themselves apart. I'm heartbroken for all the hurt that we see. I know I, I, I share your lament at all of this, and I want to start today with just a brief prayer of lament um, on what we're facing right now in the Twin Cities. We're recording this on Saturday morning after one of the hardest weeks I've ever experienced personally um, in our city. Let me pray with us. Uh, will you pray with me? Father, we're heartbroken at what we see. We're heartbroken at the injustice and a senseless murder. We're heartbroken that our city is groaning um, with so much civil unrest, Lord, we ask for your peace and we ask for your justice in this situation. We don't know how to fix it, Lord, but we do have great hope in the gospel, great hope in Jesus, great confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit, and great trust in you. And so we pray you would work in Jesus' name, amen. Um, as I continue, and I I want to take just a minute to introduce myself and our district. As I said, I serve as district superintendent um, over the North Central District, which is a family of churches all across Minnesota. You know, our district has churches uh, here in the metro. We have churches all around the straight from state, from places like uh, Fergus Falls and Grand Marais and Rochester and southwestern Minnesota and places like Wilmer in the central, uh, south, in the western central part of the state. Um, we're a family of churches that loves the gospel and the scriptures. I want to say, too, our district is so grateful for your church, that you're a part of our uh, district family. And uh, people often ask me, what does a district superintendent do? And in a word, uh, I, along with a wonderful team of, of leaders, we serve church leaders, pastors, churches just like yours. We are, uh, we are here to help in times of difficulty, like the one the Grove has been experiencing, and we celebrate in the best times, and we walk alongside one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Before I open God's word for you today, I want to begin uh, by just saying a brief word directly about the situation uh, that you're facing right now. Uh, first thing I want to say about your situation is uh, that we love the Grove, we love your church, and we're glad that you're part of our NCD family. Um, you might think that at times like this, we, go, we think, oh, it's so hard to walk through these difficulties with a church that's going through these things, but that's not the case. We are deeply grateful that you are part of our family. We are so glad to be walking alongside you. More than that, I want you to know that you have our compassion. We know by experience how churches and church leaders suffer at times like this when something like plagiarism, serious plagiarism, which is a serious moral failure, results in a pastor losing his position. Um, it, it's heartbreaking for us what you're experiencing, um, and we want you to know uh, that our compassion is with you. Uh, more than that, we want you to know too that our district 
will walk alongside your church, your church leaders, and your former pastor in the days ahead. Uh, We don't know how this is all going to unfold and how God is going to make good on his promise to bring good out of this brokenness and this hurt and this difficulty, but we know he will. And our commitment to you is that our district leadership, myself, the team I represent, your sister churches, about 160 of them scattered all across Minnesota, we're going to stand with you as you go through this tough time. Your church leaders are not going to be alone. We're going to walk alongside them to provide support and encouragement, wisdom and guidance to help bear the burden. And your former pastor, John, he's not going to walk alone either. He, he's heard this from me already, but we stand with open arms to help him and his family pursue recovery, find healing, and figure out how to move forward. And, and, and I've told John that that offer stands today. It's available next week. It's there next month, and it'll be there in six months and a year, and however long it takes to walk alongside him, and we'll do the same for you. Um, Moving forward, I want to take this opportunity to open God's word. Your leaders have invited me here, um, on the one hand, uh, because we're in the same family, but on the other hand, with a hope that, um, that I might be able to provide encouragement and help you find a little bit of initial healing um, as you try to move forward. And that's my goal today. My goal today is to serve you. My goal today is to open God's word and help you find a truth that will help you navigate this forward and to give you hope about the future. And we're going to look at a passage today that's a passage I often turn to in times of trouble and I often share with congregations who find themselves in the midst of difficulty. Uh, If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to look at this passage, and in it we're going to, we're going to, Uh, the title of my sermon, we're going to try to see the present. We're going to try to use this beautiful passage. We're going to try to use it as a lens. We're going to try to see the present through the lens of the future that God has promised. And to begin, to help us think about how lenses work, I just want to make a confession about my own eyesight. Um, I remember when I was in my mid-20s and uh, going into my early 30s, I started to discover, like many others have, that my eyes weren't working like they should be. And in those days, um, I I remember... uh, something very distinct. I would, I would be at the store and I wouldn't be able to recognize who was kind of far away so I would wave at people and my wife would kind of nudge me and say, you don't know those people. Um, or another thing that would happen is I, I remember one time in particular when my, my daughter was just a newborn. She's uh, 19 now, but when she was just a newborn, I remember putting on my wife's glasses and seeing how clearly she looked across the room and thinking, oh, maybe I got to do something about this. Well, now I'm in my mid-40s and I'm having that sad discovery that so many others are having where I'm realizing uh, that my uh, reading vision is not what it ought to be. Um, and I'm, I'm wrestling right now with the need to, uh, to get some bifocals, which is something I'm not sure I want to do. Um, many of us have had this experience where the world looks blurry and fuzzy and then you put on the right lenses and it makes all the difference. We've also had that experience, like I'm about to have, where we put on the right up close lenses and text that was blurry becomes clear. This morning, as we look at Revelation 22, it is gonna function for us like that kind of lens. We're gonna see the future that God has promised to anyone who puts their hope in Christ. We're gonna see it, and it's gonna help us look at how the world really is and see our real life as we ought to see it today. And in fact, we don't have to make up or guess at how we're gonna do that because we're gonna look at New Testament passages that take the truth of the future and apply them to everyday life in the here and now. Um, And in fact, as we go forward today, the main idea that I'm gonna be sharing all through my sermon is this. It's especially in times of trouble. True hope comes from seeing the ups and downs of our present lives through the lens of the future that God has promised to all who trust in Christ. That's what we're gonna be driving at today as we look at Revelation 22, and as we consider how the New Testament applies those truths to all kinds of life situations. So the first thing we're gonna do is jump into the future that God has promised us in Revelation 22. I'm gonna open my Bible and read it for us, and then I'll be referencing it all along the way. Revelation 22, verses one through five, the future that God has promised to us. It says this, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. 
Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And then verse six says this, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Here at the beginning of our time in the word, let me walk you through, let, us, let me walk us through what the Bible says about the future that God has promised. And it begins, as you see, with a river and a tree. If you look back down at your Bible at verses uh, one and two, they say this, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kind of fruits, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. First, we see this river and this tree. Now, this is a reference, if you were to look back in the Old Testament, it's a reference to Ezekiel chapter 47. And this river here is said to be bright as crystal. And this is a reference to holiness and purity. And it flows, the passage tells us, right from the throne of God. Likewise, this tree, it stands, it's said to stand on both sides of the river. And it's said to be always in season, bearing fruit all of the months of the year, something trees don't do that here don't do now. Now taken together, this river flowing from God's throne and this tree that's always bearing fruit, these two things together symbolize the, the life-giving, fully restored aspect of eternity. Now imagine this. Imagine a place that is perfect, healthy, and whole. Um, a place where things like, like riots and senseless murders, they don't happen. A place where there's no brokenness, where everything works right, uh, where there's not a pandemic that uh, forces us away from gathering, where there's not hurt. Um, that is what this is getting at here early in this passage with this river and tree imagery. Um, everything will be restored. That's what this imagery is pointing to. But more than that, the passage goes on. If you look back down at your Bible at verse three, the passage goes on and says, no longer will anything be accursed. Now, central in the Bible and confirmed in our experience is the idea that, that all people and our world are under a curse because of sin. Our world is broken. Our lives in this world, life in this world, it's messy. People die, work is hard, marriages fall apart, life is bitter. You know, people like us who live here in the Twin Cities need no better example of a broken world than what we're seeing all around us right now with chaos and hurt and heartbreak and injustice. So we lock our doors, we guard our wealth, we cling to our possessions, we fight decay wherever it is found, but we all know it's a losing uphill battle. Now the passage we have today makes a promise that one day, one day there will be no more curse. That all of that brokenness will be taken away now, earlier in the book of Revelation, uh, the, our passage, or the, it, it teaches that Jesus Christ, through his blood, removes that curse. Revelation 5, 9 says this about Jesus' death to remove the curse. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your bud, blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Eternity is pictured here not just in a place that's fully healed, but as a place that is uncursed, where there's no fear, where our doors don't need to be locked. The passage goes on to continue to tell this story um, about God's presence, face, and his name. If you look down at verses three through four, they say this, uh, they start, no longer will anything be accursed, but then it says this, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now first, we wanna notice that in the future, in eternity, in the heaven that God has promised to us, this 
fully restored new heaven and new earth where we are going to go live with him, God's presence is right in the center. No longer being far off, but right there with us. No longer feeling distance. Furthermore, it goes on to say we will see his face, which is a reference intended to give us the, the sense that we are in perfect and right relationship with him. Imagine looking closely face to face with another person. That's what it's getting at. This idea that, that we will be right there, intimate and close with God. Now through Christ, our distance from God has been closed and we're no longer in a broken relationship, but it is not like looking directly at his face, which is coming in the future. And then it says his name will be on our foreheads. And this, I think, can sound a little strange, um, but really what it's saying is we will be marked as him and we will be known as God's own people, visibly, under his protection, in that perfect place, his children bearing his name. Now taken together, his presence, seeing his face, being marked with his name, they signify an absolutely perfect, whole, unhindered relationship with God that is simply impossible to exaggerate. That is coming for us. That's part of this future that God has promised. Two more things I want to talk about as we think about the future God has promised. Uh, one is there's no more night. If you look down at Revelation 22.5, it says, and night will be no more. Now when the passage says night will be more, more, no more, it's indicating that in the new heaven and the new earth, things like fear and danger, all the things that make us afraid of the dark, all the things that make us concerned about going out in the night, all the things that allow things like rioting and, and, uh, and violence to happen in the dark in the city, those things will be no more. God says rather, uh, the, the passage here says rather, the whole place will be lit up by God's own presence. You know, there's a cartoon I remember from when I was younger. It's from the far side, and, and it, it's this hysterical cartoon, I think, of, of a kid who was, at one point it says this, um, it says, eventually, Stevie looked up, and his mother was nowhere in sight, um, and he was certainly not in the toy department any longer. And I just, I, I always connect with that fear of when you're a kid, and you're, you're in a store, and all of a sudden, you look up, and your mom's not there, and you have that sense of fear, and you feel a little lost, and I always thought this kind of was a, a funny way to really emphasize that, but that idea, that fear of the dark, that's going away in the future. The, the future that God has promised us, that what makes this cartoon funny will be utterly, utterly gone. Finally, verse five gives us one more detail that I wanna, I wanna share with you. In, in uh, 22.5, it says this, and they will reign forever and ever. You see, the final word on this future that God has promised us, the final word is that it's not gonna last for a day or a week or even a lifetime or even 10 lifetimes. It's going to last forever and ever, age to age, life with God in a perfect place, a place free from decay, where there's no fear, where justice is fully right, where people live at total peace. That's the vision that God has given us about the future he has promised. It's a sure future. It will happen. Now, here's what I want to do with the remainder of our time together. As we think about the situation we're in, in a discouraging time like this, both because of the coronavirus, what your church has gone through specifically, and then this terrible unrest we're facing right now, what I wanna do is instead of just allowing ourselves through our broken eyes to gaze at all those problems, I wanna, I wanna take a step back and ask what would they look like if we looked at them through the lens of that future that God has promised, where there's no more curse, where God's presence is fully known, where there's no more night, where we reign forever and ever with him, any who believe. And I want to take in really four places that the New Testament talks about how the future shapes our view on the here and now. The first uh, thing I want to look at through the lens of the future is trouble and suffering. Trouble and suffering. Now that, those things on the one hand are universal, but, but if you're like me, they feel more acute than they felt in a long time whether it's the coronavirus, the fear uh, that goes along with it, whether it's the, the, the worry about what's going to happen in our economy, in our recession, in our schools, in uh, our future, whether it's the violence and injustice that's going on, um, that's gone on and is going on, whether it's any of these things, trouble and suffering um, are heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking to us. 
Now, the authors of the New Testament were not foreign to this reality. They suffered also. They suffered big time. And they often chose to view their troubles through the very lens that we're talking about. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, says these words about trouble and suffering when we think about them in light of eternity. He says this, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. How does the lens of the future change the view of our troubles and suffering? It doesn't make them disappear. It doesn't shield our eyes from them. But according to the Apostle Paul, when you look at trouble and suffering through the lens of the future, it is light and momentary. And it's hard to imagine uh, that. It, it, it's, he, he makes the point that it's fleeting, that it's soon going to disappear. Um, now, far from being meaningless, the difficulties that we're facing, they're also achieving something, in his words. They're achieving an awor- eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Now, when I look at what's going on right now, I, I have trouble thinking about those things like that. But when I, when I think about the future, a new heaven, a new earth where righteousness dwells, where God is present, where we are in his midst, where there is no more darkness or fear or night or terror, then I think maybe, they, maybe I really ought to believe that they are light and momentary. I want to invite you today to think about your troubles, the troubles of the coronavirus, the troubles you may be facing personally, the difficult season this church is in, and the heartbreaking moments we are facing right now in the metro and across our state uh, due to injustice and unrest. Think of them in light of the future because one day God will remake this world so thoroughly that they will be but a distant memory and they will feel, they will feel light and momentary. Second thing I want to bring to your attention to view from the future through this lens of the future is our sin, our own sin. Our suffering looks different, but you know what looks different? Our own sin looks different. Uh, The words of 2 Peter um, make this very clear. 2 Peter 3, I think I have the reference wrong in the slides, but 2 Peter 3, 13 through 14, say this about our own sin uh, when looked through at the lens of eternity. It says this, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's Peter's summary phrase for the truth of Revelation 22. And then he goes on to say this, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. What Peter is saying here is that that we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And because of this, you and I should look at our own sin and be eager to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. Instead of, instead of taking this time while we wait for Jesus to return and set things aright and just kind of saying, okay, we're covered by the cross, we can do whatever, our sin's not that big a deal. Instead of that, it should motivate us all the more to be eager to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, it doesn't mean we try to earn any kind of salvation or any kind of justification before God because of our our goodness. That's not what it means. Rather, it's saying, because Jesus is coming back, because this world is being restored, you need to be eager to put off sin. Can I just say directly, and and I'm going to try to say this with care, it would have been so tempting to try to minimize uh, what had happened with your church and with Pastor John. It would have been tempting to brush it under the rug, especially during this time in the coronavirus. Can I just say, that the loving thing to do, the good thing to do, the right thing to do, the thing to do as we wait for a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells is what your leaders did and what John is doing, which is to face it directly. To face it directly, to take it as serious, to try to, try to work through it. My great hope is that this time will, you can look back on this time someday and say this was a time where we, 
We wrestled with our brokenness and sin, and we, we looked at it in the eye, and we moved forward in faith, and I think that can happen, and, and that's part of why I'm so committed to laboring alongside you in the months and years to come to help you seek healing and restoration and wholeness and help John seek healing and restoration and wholeness. Two more areas I wanna address briefly as I conclude our time together. Um, we talked about how the lens of the future helps us uh, think about trouble and suffering. We talked about it, how it helps us think about our own sin. I wanna talk about today how it helps us think about our present experience of God, how we can view our present experience of God through the lens of the future. I think one of the hardest things about the Christian life um, is the distance we still have from God. Uh, on the one hand, the gospel closes the gap, um, but on the other hand, he is not immediately present like he will be in the future that God has promised. Sometimes we pray and we can't hear his voice. Sometimes we read his word and we can't discern enough about him. We see his work in our lives and we see his work in this world and we can see him. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I just long for more. I long for his real presence. I long for that distance to be closed. Well, here's the thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 takes up this question. It takes up this question. Um, see, the... the the experience we have of God right now is not all there is. And it is a joy to be rescued by the gospel and to know Jesus Christ. But can I just tell you there's a better relationship coming in the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10 and 12 puts it this way. It says, when the perfect comes, and it's speaking about that day, when the perfect comes, the partial, the partial will pass away. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. You know, one of the things that helps me think about what this is going to be like is what my experience was like as I waited for both of my kids to be born. Uh, now, pregnancy for dads is a little different than pregnancy for moms. I remember my wife, from moment one of pregnancy, had this intimate and hard to describe connection with our children because they were in her and they were growing in her. And occasionally for me, I would be able to feel a foot on the side of my wife's stomach or I would, I would be able to see the heartbeat on an ultrasound. And, and on the one hand, that brought me joy, but I was so eager for that day where I could see my children face to face. When those days came for each of our children, I will, I will, I'll never forget the difference between the anticipation of the child being in my arms and my son Samuel and my daughter Grace actually being in my arms. Brothers and sisters, a day is coming where what we have right now, good as it is, will be replaced by us being in the arms of God present, by us seeing him directly, by us gathering around his throne in his perfect new heaven and new earth. Um, that day is coming and it should help us think about these days. And then finally, quickly, a fourth thing is wealth and success in this life through the lens of the future. You know, we live in a, a you live, I, I live in one too, a part of uh, Minnesota that has quite a bit of both. And on the one hand, wealth and success, they're not bad. Um, they provide a lot of good. They're worth pursuing in measure and in their place. On the other hand, they don't answer all of life's problems. They don't fill you up. Um, they don't heal your soul. Uh, wealth and success cannot insulate a congregation like the Grove from the difficulty you have faced in recent days. They can't insulate any of us from the heartbreak or the need to take active steps to pursue justice in light of what's going on. They just can't do that. And, and interestingly, Jesus says this directly. Um, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus says these words about wealth and success, and he says them with an eye toward eternity. He says this, do not lay up for yourselves, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Now again, wealth and success they're desirable in this life, but they are fleeting. They will fade or be taken away. Um, not so with the future that God has promised us. 
the treasure in heaven that Jesus is talking about is durable. It's trustworthy. It's stable. And he is saying to us, lay up for yourselves treasure there. Put your hope in the future that God has promised. Let it color how you live this life day in and day out. Now I'm grateful, brothers and sisters, for the chance to have been with you. I'm heartbroken. As I conclude, I just want to say I I remain heartbroken for what you're going through. I know it is a very difficult season. My heart of compassion and the team that I serve, our heart of compassion goes out to Pastor John as well. And we're going to walk alongside him. And my hope is that much better than even our help, so much better, is that you will remember that you and I, who have been rescued through the gospel of Jesus Christ, have been given an eternal hope and a future that is sure. And as we look at the troubles that we're facing today, as we look at the troubles our city is facing today, as we think about the coronavirus and the extended trouble, season of trouble, that has, that has put our, uh, our nation and our world in, we will put our hope in Jesus Christ. We will remember the promise of a new heaven and new earth, and we will be able to experience now, in measure, and then fully, the peace that he offers of his presence. Let me pray. Father in heaven, help us to walk with you today. Give us perspective. Heal our eyes so that we can see these events aright from your eternal perspective. Uh, Help us to uh, not just take comfort, but have courage to seek you and walk with you into these situations bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to any who would receive it, putting our hope in that gospel and experiencing life. We pray these things because Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Amen.
be strong enough to save. Rise your shackles on no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord. For he alone is strong enough to save. Hey, thanks for joining us in worship this morning. We're really excited you guys have been with us. And we're excited to see what God's gonna do in your life and in our lives this next week. I wanna remind you again tonight at 7 p.m. we have a concert of, of prayer. It's an opportunity for us to seek God uh, together as a church body and we, we really expect it to be a powerful time. And so if it's an hour of your night, I'd highly encourage you to prioritize it. But I also wanna encourage you as uh, the week comes, we have an opportunity for you to reach out and let us know how we can be praying for you. If you maybe need a, a pastor or a staff person to reach out to you, we'd love to be interacting with you in your life in this season as we continue to live in the space of social distancing. I know a lot of us are getting frustrated with being isolated or separated, but it doesn't mean we can't come sit on your porch or go on a walk or connect in different ways. And so please let us as church staff know how we can be a part of your lives. We're so thankful you're a part of the Grove and we look forward to worshiping with you next week together. Have a great Sunday.